G'day Fools, I'm Scott Phillips, the Motley Fools Chief Investment Officer here in Australia, and welcome to another Stocks in Focus video, where we spend time talking about the companies that you probably own, the ones that are the widest held, the ones that are in the media most often, or the ones that have news, something worth talking about, or simply just, as I said, one of those companies that defines corporate Australia, and it doesn't get more definitional, it doesn't get more corporate, it doesn't get more Australia, well there's a bit more than that, than National Australia Bank, or the NAB. And with me to talk about it is Motley Fool analyst extraordinaire, Benny O. G'day, Benny. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. How are you doing, Scott? Mate, I'm very, very well. Benny, NAB, look, it's, it's almost hard to... I, I normally start these videos by putting some context behind what's going on. And it's hard to go back far enough because the last two years, we're now literally over two years since COVID arrived on Australian shores, have been nothing short of extraordinary. And because it happened kind of two-thirds of the way through a financial year... It really means we're now three full financial years away from the last time things were normal. Now, over that time, we've seen bank shares up and down all over the place like yo-yos. We've seen predictions of housing crisis crashing, all that stuff. And of course, the reality of house prices surging. We've had the tail end of the Royal Commission. We've seen bank inquiries. It's been a very, very busy space. If you're a bank a CEO or bank manager, a bank chair or board director, Mate, let's try and wrap it somehow together. Give me a sense of what NAB is and what it does. We know it's a bank, of course, but let's, let's, let's line, lay out a little bit of the detail. And then what it's been through over the last couple of years. Yeah, not a problem. I think you said it well. It's, there's a lot of changes even happening through the bank and the banking sector in general. Um, but if I mm. take a few steps back and, and, and talk about what NAB is and, and who they are, so NAB is actually one of the uh, largest or four largest financial institutions in Australia. Um, it's headquarters in Melbourne. It's got around 32,000 employees. I used to be a former one, just for the record. Um, there's 750 Something. branches, business centers, and it's serving around 8 million customers. Um, so the bank's been in operations for around, I say, over 160 years. So it was originally called National Bank of Australasia. Uh, and this is before no, it merged not. with commercial bank of commercial banking company of Sydney. Mm -hmm. This is 40 years ago, uh, and that's when they formed National Australia Bank. Uh, but today, what we know NAB as, it's better known as Australia New Zealand's largest and strongest business bank. And mm -hmm. so it does have other subsidiaries and other franchises under its umbrella. Uh, it's got Bank of New Zealand. Uh, it's also got JB Ware, which is a wealth platform. Mm -hmm that they bought from Goldman Sachs, uh, and they've got Ubank, which is a digital-only bank. But 12 months ago, back in January 2021, they did announce uh, to the market that they were going to, uh, or planning to acquire a uh, digital-only bank called 86400. And 86400 has been a, a challenger bank in the market. It's sold up $1 billion in home loans, it's got 120 employees, and it's got 100,000 in customers. But, um, but NAB, I think strategically announced to, to acquire this company to obviously bolster its digital banking experience uh, to its consumers going forward together with Ubank. Uh, but there are four main divisions in, um, in, in, in the bank. So first one and the largest one is probably business and private bank. This is a division where they offer business market loans, they offer business transaction accounts, they offer private wealth products to high net worth in clients. Uh, but they've got around 26% market share in the small, medium enterprise lending space. Uh, second division, you've got personal banking. Um, I think we probably knows uh, mortgages. You've got your traditional deposits, traditional term deposits, and uh, transaction accounts. Uh, and the NAB actually has around, I say, I believe it's 14.5% market share in this space. Uh, and it's growing. And mm -hmm. they recently announced the acquisition of or plans to acquire the Citibank's um, Citigroup, I should say, uh, the consumer business. Right. Uh, and that's the scale of their credit card business mm. and uh, a lot of their personal loans and, and personal deposits and, um, and personal transaction accounts. Um, but that's a bit of news in the, in, in the, in the papers. And ACCC uh, had conducted a review because uh, they thought that by acquiring Citigroup, uh, the consumer business, um, it would have taken some, I guess, competition in the market. But after some review, I think they've come to a conclusion that it won't because a lot of the white labor providers and other competitors said that there's still going to be competition in the market, especially in the credit card space. Um, 
by acquiring Citigroup's consumer business, they become the second largest credit card provider uh, behind CBA. So they are fighting for that position with CBA. Uh, but there's actually two other divisions, the corporate institutional division, and this entails corporate finance. So you think about your debt capital markets and your, your asset finance. If you need a, uh, those airlines or these boats that need to finance their, their, their planes and assets, this is where the, I guess the more corporate institutional level banking comes into play. Um, and lastly, you've got New Zealand banking, which I mentioned is via uh, Bank of New Zealand, what we call BNZ. And lastly, I, I think I'll point to the, who's running the show and who's running the bank, Ross McEwen. Uh, so n- not many people know him, but some do know him. And he actually joined the bank in 2019 as the CEO and managing director. He came from a CEO executive role in Royal Bank of Scotland. And it was in this role where he gained a lot of credibility and, and market attention because he helped restructure and turn around the bank from where it was because it was going through high levels of change. And it did a very, it executed very successfully. And I think he's been a natural great fit for this new NAB role. And, and since then he's, he's implemented a new refresh strategy, which I'll touch on a bit later. Uh, but uh, so far uh, he's been doing quite well. Very, very nice. I mean, it's been an interesting time to be a, a bank shareholder, a bank customer, We've seen house prices, of course, through the roof up 22% in 2021. Already mentioned the COVID impacts, of course. The predictions of doom from a from a 30 to 40% crash predicted by some of the usual suspects to a to a, uh, an actual growth of 22% in 12 months. That's a remarkable difference if you think about the, the sheer dollar value of a minus 30 and a plus 22. If you put those together, it's it's, it's a heck of a thing. It's also been an interesting time because the questions around bank costs remain ever present and it may come to uh, the pros and cons we'll cover in a minute but it's also interesting just a time to be in banking uh, as we move away from a, a branch i was in a branch literally it was a cba branch only last week and i have to say this this will age me mate although i'm not still not entirely sure how long it's been i walked into the branch to deposit a check um funnily enough i got a dividend from a company that i hadn't actually had time or hadn't got around to put in my banking details so they sent me a check i went oh bugger to go to a bank i walked in and couldn't find the deposit slips Turns out they don't have deposit slips anymore. Uh, so there you go. That's how long it's been since I've been literally into a bank branch. Last time I was there, I wrote down on the deposit slip my account number and details. So that probably ages me, but it also talks to the change in banking, right? There was a time when every week or so, someone would go into a bank. I, I think I've probably told this story before. When I was a kid and we wanted to go on holidays, it was only an hour drive away, hour and a half drive away. The old man had to go into a bank, the local bank, and get them to send his deposit, uh, sorry, his signature slip down to the other bank. So when he went down to the other bank and got some money out over the counter, he could prove who he was. This is the days, of course, before ATMs and, and cards and all that kind of stuff. So a lot has changed in my lifetime. It's a long lifetime, I grant you, but a lot has changed. Mate, let, let's, go to, let's go to some of the pros and cons. And we'll do the pros and then we'll do the cons. We'll try and keep them separate. And then at the end, I'll get you to try and wrap up and give me the, the bottom line as to whether you expect NAB to be a market beater or not. So stay tuned for that one. Let's kick off, mate, with the pros. What, what are some of the reasons? If you're going to try and convince me to buy NAB shares today, what excuse, what reason, what rationale, what analysis would you present? To get me to buy those shares. Probably the first point I'll point towards is, um, despite the challenging backdrop that we've all gone through and the banks have experienced, um, NAB's actually proven to the market that it's remained quite resilient. And I think this is reflected from the strong growth performance that they've delivered across its business uh, in the last financial year. So if you look at some of the numbers that they delivered, um, they saw improving earnings growth, which is across the board. Uh, and I think the market really, really liked this, uh, given the reflection in its share price rise or rally in the last 12 months. Uh, but cash earnings was up 77% year on year to $6.56 billion. You've got, um, they've returned to double digit return on equity uh, growth of 10.7%. Uh, this is still below its, um, I guess, FY19 of around 12.4. But if you look at what FY20 was, it was around 8 3. So it is increasing and it's improving. And I think the upcoming year and the upcoming few years, we'll like to see this gradually pick up. Um, it's lifted its four-year franc dividends to $1.27. And this was around, I think, $0.60 cents in the previous year, which is the lowest I've seen, to be honest. Um, I know back when I was working in NAB, uh, some of the guys would always say they're never going to change the uh, $0.99 cents, uh, interim <laughs> dividend. And, and then I, I joined the bank, and as soon as that happened, uh, it went down. And so uh, we never know. We might so go you're back saying it's to your fault time. you're saying it was a coincidence. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> it might be a coincidence, <laughs> but uh, I did go through it together with the bank, so that's a fine. 
but what we've been seeing is a reduction in charges in provision. So they've had $3 billion of reduction, which is significant for the bank. And I think that the market really likes this as well. And I think that might continue to improve as we see the economy rebound. Uh, and I think lastly, I'll point to is probably the capital position is incredibly strong. Common equity tier one capital ratio is at 13%. So this capital ratio is the amount of capital that the bank needs to hold against its assets. And so this is currently sitting well above APRA's kind of requirement around 10.5%. Uh, but I mentioned before about the City, City Group uh, Consumer Business Bank, oh, sorry, Consumer Acquisition. Um, and also, they've also announced a $2.5 billion on-market share buyback. Uh, and, and both of these will help reduce, oh, will actually reduce its uh, common equity tier one capital ratio to around, I think, the low 12%. Uh, but I still think this is quite strong still. It's still in a great position. It's still well above APRA and its own targets. And I think this will provide the bank with more flexibility down the track to potentially improve its capital allocation and, and, and provide further uplift in its dividend growth as well as potential share, share buybacks. And I think management and Ross McEwen have um, expressively, uh, I guess, told its shareholders and the public in its AGM um, about continuously improving its return on equity by reducing the share count. Uh, and I think that's a great, uh, great, great signal to the shareholders right now. Um, but secondly, I think the bank the bank I mentioned before, it's got a renewed strategy. Uh, I think this is delivering solid progress so far. And what it's been doing, it's, it's starting to pay off as we see the economy uh, rebound from all these lockdowns, restrictions, and seeing everyone out and about. But um, you might ask what this renewed strategy is. This renewed strategy, it was implemented around 20 years, oh, sorry, 20 months ago, uh, when Ross McEwen first started. And that, that's pretty much going back to basics, to focus on its core shrinks. And the core strengths of the bank is obviously becoming the leader or being the leader in business banking. And it's trying to improve this kind of revenue pro growth profile. And so far, it's, it's been executing quite well and it's been doing it very disciplinedly. Um, so if you look at the last financial year in terms of the performance, you see the business and private bank division has actually done operationally quite well, uh, especially in the second half, uh, despite we're seeing those sporadic lockdowns. Um, well, I guess a few of the headline numbers and, and headline figures the SME business lending uh, division actually grew 7%, and this is growing 1.4 times the system growth. Um, and if you look at mm. business and private bank mortgage growth, I think this was outstanding, two times system growth, which is double, which is improving, obviously, taking market share from others in the market. Um, but these are really, really outstanding numbers, and, and I think the bank and the management team uh, are looking forward for this to be ongoing and continue that momentum. Uh, and they, they, I guess they're attributing to a lot of this, not just purely on pricing or, or in terms of um, margin um, compressions. They're talking about deeper banker-customer relationships. They're talking about stronger advice provided. They're talking about the bank's current focus, which is obviously to help the bank be disciplined in lending margins, but obviously encompassing the whole relationship, so to be the go-to bank if they need a transaction account, if they need a business lending, if they need FX, foreign exchange needs, the bank to go. And I think that's what Ross McEwen is, is there to do and he's doing an excellent job right now. Um, but lastly, I think to, to, to cover that point is probably to mm. mention about the exposure to the business lending space. They've got a dominant position, 22% business lending market share. So I think I really like this aspect of the bank where it's, it's obviously... Um, got that growth orientation towards the business rebounding and business potentially increasing the capital expenditure to obviously expand. Mm. Uh, but I think time will tell, uh, but they've set themselves in a really, really good space right now for them to continue. Very nice, mate. That's a compelling case, a compelling bull case at least, we'll hear the bear case in a second, for buying shares in NAB. We should say you do own shares in NAB, I do not. Um, don't want to feel used to, but I don't think we do anymore. So there you go. There's a, a quick disclosure for everybody as we think about the positives, and we should put that disclosure with the positives because uh, you want to see those in that light. Before we go to the cons, before we go to you trying to talk me out of an investment in NAB shares, Benny, um, I will make, mention a couple of quick things, quick ad 
because if you haven't yet done it, please hit the subscribe button just below this video. Apparently it's down there, all the cool kids do that, so it's down there. Uh, hit the subscribe button for me. Also hit the notification bell so that next time Ben is here sharing some of the good stuff or any of the rest of the team are here as well, sharing some of their wisdom with you, you won't miss the video. It'll just a little pop-up will come up on your YouTube uh, somewhere on your, on your computer, on your screen, on your device and say, hey, new video, make sure you check it out. So if you don't want to miss anything from us, it's free, I keep telling you, it's great content, really high quality content from the team. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and then the notification bell. If you're more of a podcast fan, of course, we know you're a YouTube fan because you're here and we love it. Um, but do make sure you check out our podcast, Motley Fool Money or The Good Oil with Scott Phillips. When I say or, I mean and, of course. Motley Fool Money and The Good Oil with Scott Phillips. Uh, again, free podcast, Motley Fool Money, three episodes a week. The Good Oil is a conversation podcast I held about one a fortnight we're releasing at the moment. Really, really cool content with some fantastic people. Again, free content from The Motley Fool. If you're enjoying this, and why wouldn't you be? Try and get more from us right across the board uh, by making sure you check out those podcasts and of course, this YouTube channel. If you do want an email from us with the best deals we have available on our services, you can go to fool.com.au forward slash take dash stock. So T-A-K-E dash S-T-O-C-K. You sign up for our newsletter there. Full disclosure, we give you lots of marketing material. So you're going to get that if you subscribe, but you're also going to get emails from me and the rest of the team. Uh, often, I'm normally, normally two or three times a week. So again, that's also free. You get the marketing material, you get some free great content, plus all this great stuff. I don't know why we're giving so much away, but we are. Hopefully you're getting some value from it as well. All right, Benny, that's the end of the ad. Let's go to the cons. You've tried to talk me into buying NAB shares. Now talk me out of it. Tell me why you sh we shouldn't buy NAB shares right now. So the first con I'll probably point towards is uh, in, my, in my view, I think the outlook for the bank's profit margin, so what they call NIM and the net interest margin, I think its growth is likely to continue to be difficult in the next few years. Um, so what we've seen is NIM growth actually continue to be pressured, and it actually fell nine basis points to around 1.69% in the last financial year. In contrast, um, this NIM was actually around 2.23% 10 years ago. Um, Yes, wow. it's significantly lower. Uh, a, however, a fall, right? like, I mean, it's it is a small fall. number of percentage points, but a massive, massive drop. Yeah, exactly. Yes, we can. We probably can attribute some of this to the falling interest rates, um, but a lot of this NIM pressure has actually been driven from, uh, firstly, the bank holding higher liquids. So this is what they called HQLA, high quality liquid assets, and obviously this was to support the current balance sheet, its current balance sheet, as well as the current economy. Uh, secondly, we've seen expenses. Um, increasing massively. Uh, um, this is obviously due to digitization, simplification, a lot of the automation work that the, the Ross McEwen is doing with the bank. Uh, but we've seen similar stories across the banks, but also in the US banks, which they've uh, recently reported hmm. um, in the earnings season. Thirdly, I think there's, um, which is a really big point, is an increasing competition in the home lending market. So we're seeing more and more players in the mortgage lending space going to price pools, aggressively pricing, uh, and this is obviously putting downward pressure in terms of the housing lending margins. Uh, and I think lastly, I think a lot more people have seen the potential for hate, um, rate hikes. And so what NAB has seen is uh, they've seen a more sh mixed shift towards fixed rate lending, which obviously they've got to turn around or to improve their margins if they need to get out of these fixed rate lending. Uh, but all in all, I think while, does, while these rate hikes do... I see a, a bit impending in the future. I think this does enable banks to increase their lending rates. Mm. However, I think this may have impacts in terms of the borrowing capacity that uh, the consumers may have, which ultimately affects housing markets. And we have all seen Australian banks are very, very sensitive mm. to the housing market. Um, another point I'd like to make is probably about the, um, the expected higher funding costs that's about to arise. So the banks in Australia have recently been benefiting from lower funding uh, from deposits. So a lot more people are placing money in, in, in transaction accounts, deposits that are paying 0%. I think I was looking at some of the data, it was around $285 billion in transaction accounts that are paying 0%, wow. which is cheap funding for the banks. That's not uh, much. But the banks have also... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the banks have also, um, I guess, uh, benefited from... A, a facility called Term Funding Facility, TFF. And so this is a facility that's been established by the Reserve Bank of Australia. And this is aimed at offering lower cost fixed rate funding to allow the economy to pick back up, to, to, to spur more lending, to, to drive more spending in the, in the economy. 
Uh, but overall, the banks have borrowed $188 billion. NAB alone has draw down or drew down its, I think it was $17.6 billion. But all of this needs to be repaid and needs to be repaid in the near future. And so when that time does come and it may come sooner than later, um, the banks need to go into other funding sources and, and wholesale market is one of them. And this is typically where they issue bonds or debt instruments or even equity. And, and this is a space where or you typically, typically have higher cost of funding uh, compared to your TFF and compared to your deposits. Uh, but I think this tailwind does diminish, like I mentioned, and, and I think ongoing NIM pressures will likely remain. Um, secondly, I mentioned about competition from the home lending market. Uh, there's also increasing competition in the business banking sector, which is uh, NAB's bread and butter. So you've got comp competition from fintechs like Judo Bank, uh, which um, was founded in 2015 by former NAB bankers. So they know the ins and outs of business banking. Uh, but they're looking to challenge NAB um, with a more relationship-led focus and a more I guess, focus on SME, small, medium enterprise lending. Uh, they, they claim that traditional banks have become disengaged. They claim to have a more customer-centric approach, and they think they're, they're, they've got a more modern value proposition, obviously challenging these banks. But not only that, you're also getting competition from CBA, a large big four bank, and they're heavily invested in technology. They're well advanced in data analytics, uh, and they've been hiring more and more bankers, providing aggressive pricing. So there is that threat coming from within the big four banks and outside in fintechs. Um, third point I'd like to make is probably ongoing regulation and the uncovering of misconduct uh, that continues to be a significant headwind for, for NAB. Um, it's currently going through an Austrack investigation and this is associated with um, your AML KYC, so anti-money laundering and your know your client compliance. And it's likely to be going for the next 18, 24, or even longer. But what this tells me is that there's likely to be, yes, one-off and non-recurring, but they're likely to be uh, op high operational costs, upgrades in terms of procedures and systems, um, and also changes of, uh, I guess, compliance notices or enforcement undertakings, uh, which all come at a cost. Uh, you need resources. You need to hire more people. You need to get your third party reviewers, you get lawyers. There's a lot of, there's a mountain of costs that, that needs to be coming across. And there's also a class action of around $200 million that was in the papers recently about NAB uh, facilitating types of transactions that they shouldn't have. And so these all come randomly unexpected. And these are costs that NAB has to consider that they haven't obviously priced into their models or forecasts. Um, the last one I'd like to point to, I uh, think, this is probably a common one and, and, and they're probably trying to work, work through at the moment is the ongoing uncertainty in the economic rebound. So when the lockdowns did ease, uh, we saw the economy pick back up gradually. Uh, however, we've been struck again by sporadic lockdowns, sporadic restrictions, a new, uh, new variants, and all of this is obviously driving lower sentiment and business confidence. Uh, and, and from the NAB business survey uh, recently, you've seen that drop and clearly slowing. So it is a stop and go kind of mechanism and, and doesn't really help with these businesses that want to obviously fast track and build themselves back up. Uh, but only time will tell again. Uh, hopefully this is only a blip in the market. Uh, but um, we hopefully see that this consumer spending does pick back up despite seeing the ANZ one in terms of ANZ's data showing that it's dropped. Um, and so... I think the last one I'd like to make is probably the optimism. I think while I would like to see um, the economy rebound and, and pick back itself up, yeah. what we've seen in the last two years is yeah. it's still we're still talking about it. We're still going through this lockdowns or still going through types of conversations about where are we, where's the economy. Uh, unless we see more consistency in the economy, I think that's when we are likely to see NAB pick back up. Mate, that's a very, very, very thorough bear and bull case you've given us. You obviously know the business very, very well. And i got to say, you think about, you know, people describe Australia's big four banks as being pretty plain vanilla retail banks, not that complex. And yet you've taken us through four or five each of pros and cons. And individually, we could have talked about for half an hour. You've done it in, in fantastic fashion, mate. So thank you for spending a little bit of time and spending your uh, sharing with us your expertise so we can know a little bit more about NAB and its prospects.
but I am going to hold your feet to the fire now, Benny. I am going to get you to try and push one way or the other. If we look out five or so years, so look, let's take it back a step. The Motley Fool, we're long-term investors. We look out normally three to five years, preferably five years plus with all of our investments because in the short term, gyrations happen, right? Volatility happens, whether it's legitimate or not, we know things bounce around. In the long term, we firmly believe that price follow, follows value. In other words, the longer you, longer out you go, uh, the closer the share price will be to the company's underlying value. And if we can find businesses that have growing value and higher value in the years ahead, that's a pretty good combination. Thus far across the full, we've done a pretty good job of getting that pretty right most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time. And so I'm gonna ask you to look out that five years. Now, if you're not beating the market, buy a market ETF is my general advice. But, so, so, so in saying that, that's why we say that our benchmark, our bogey we're chasing is the market itself. If we can't beat the market, we should just sell our shares and buy the market. So the question for you, if there are viewers, there will be plenty of viewers watching this and saying, is now the right time to buy NAB shares? My question to answer that to you is, do you think NAB will be a market leader or lagger? Will it be beat the market over five plus years or is it likely to fall behind, do you reckon? Scott, if you had asked me that in terms of the banking sector in Australia, I probably <laughs> would prefer a yeah. bank with a more business lending exposure, more business orientated. And so, hence, I think NAB has a good chance of outperforming its peers, uh, given its most leverage to the reopening of the economy and given its strong market position in terms of the business space. However, in terms of being the overall market, I think over the long term, in my personal view, I think that NAB will likely not outperform and might likely be in the laggard. Uh, if you look at the last, I guess, six years, seven years, the NAB share price has been incredibly volatile, like you mentioned. And it's, it's underperformed compared to the market. So while I think the disclaimer is probably, while we shouldn't look at past performance as an indicator of future performance, I think the key takeaway here is that the overall economy, the overall banking industry, it can experience unexpected events that significantly impacts the bank's profitability and limits its revenue growth and disruption into, into its operations. And so a lot of things like the Royal Commission, like you mentioned earlier, uh, you got uh, regulators clamping down on anti-money laundering and, and know your client types of compliance stuff. Uh, you got the sensitivity to housing markets. You got the consumer and business confidence and conditions. Uh, volatility in global rates and FX markets. This has this has uh, impacted NAB's trading uh, uh, division, which obviously is down significantly compared to previous years. But you've been seeing this globally. You're seeing it in all the other banks. However, this is a condition of the banking industry. And, and what we've gone through recently, a global pandemic. No one would have foreshadowed this. No one would have guessed this to happen in 2020, 2021. So there's all these things that are out of the bank's control. And I think that makes it a, a less compelling investment opportunity. If you're looking for companies that consistently grow, consistently beat the market, consistently um, grow its margins, grow its revenue growth. There's all these other companies out there that are better opportunities. Um, and so lastly, I think the biggest emphasize here is the banks, while they are taking the measures to reduce their costs, to, to uh, I guess, automate, simplify, um, it's easier said than done. There's a lot of complications involved in terms of um, uh, integration, streamlining. It's very costly and it's challenging for large organization. It's easy to say that we're going to narrow down the processes to from 400 to 20. Uh, but in the real case, the reality is that um, a lot of these takes time. A lot of these costs a lot of money. And like I said before, sometimes the cost outweighs the benefits. So there might be delays in implementing, but there's also the factor that uh, um, people don't actually foster uh, innovation or emerging technology going forward. So that's my take on, on the bottom line here. Very good, Benny. I think you've nailed it on the head. You're, you've done far more research on NAB than I have, but I tend to agree with you. It's amazing that over the past well, maybe the 30 or 40 years from 1980, maybe not quite the 35 years, banks were this money minting machines. You could almost extrapolate from history and say, look how great they're going. Everything's fantastic. Over the last five years, NAB shares are actually down more than 10%, if you can believe that. And that's kind of the changing nature of, of banking. Those banks have become so big, so dominant. There's not a lot of growth room left. And as you mentioned, some of those pressures are starting to weigh more heavily on the big banks. So, mate, you're saying it's an underperformer. I can't say I disagree with you over the next five plus years. We will see. As you say, so much depends on what happens in the economy. 
and particular parts of the economy as well as competition. So Benny, thank you for spending some time with us and sharing your expertise with me and with our audience. Of course, thank you for watching. We know you can do almost anything else with your time. And if you're spending a little bit of time with us, we appreciate it. We hope we've given you more value uh, than you've had to give up to watch this. Hopefully that's what we're doing every time we do a video like this. We're sharing with you something that'll hopefully make you a better investor, give you an insight into these businesses and a view on these companies' future. So all that's left for me to say is on behalf of Benny, myself, and the whole Motley Fool team, until next time, fool on.